Welcome to another episode of Huntsman Knows How. I'm your host, Kevin Gunderson, Vice President of Communications and Government Affairs. And I'm pleased to be joined by our Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, Peter Huntsman. Peter, welcome to the Huntsman Knows How podcast. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Nice to be here. How does it feel to appear on a podcast that bears your name? I don't know how. (laughs) Well, it's my first time hosting a podcast, so I have one goal for today, which is to continue to be employed by the company after this is over. Well, Bell, the best of luck. Peter, we're going to get into a lot of issues in this conversation, uh, but I wanted to start with the business of the day, which was our earnings call this morning. And the press release that we announced yesterday, you discussed our 2023 fourth quarter earnings. And I was struck by your comments about this being the toughest demand environment in well over a decade. On the call with analysts, you also expressed some optimism as we head into 2024 and you're starting to see some positive signs from the marketplace. Can you talk about the current business environment for the company and the chemical industry? Well, yes. Setting it up, I think it's important just to remember over the course of the last two years, I think that we've we've been in somewhat of a pendulum of supply and demand. So during COVID, everything shut down. And uh, then it seemed like we raced out of of, uh, COVID. We raced out of lockdown. Everybody was back to normal quicker and faster than, than we all anticipated. Inventories had been run dry. And so in the latter part of 21, 22, at a time when few people were envisioning such a, a, a quick bounce back, all of a sudden our customers find themselves without inventory. And in some cases we had supply chains that had, slow, that had well, not slowed, but it virtually stopped during COVID. And all of a sudden COVID ends, and customers are buying up everything they can. They're concerned they're not going to be getting enough. They're concerned that the shipping lines out in Los Angeles Harbor and China and so forth are, are going to be cutting into their business. So I think that there was in 2020, COVID starts and you see this drop off in demand. And then 2021, latter part 2021, going to 2020, you see this huge spike in demand. And then you see this, all of a sudden everybody sees that they can get product the economy starts to slow, inflation starts to take its toll, and everybody stops buying all of a sudden. And you see this massive drop off. Now, I don't think the economy slowed as much as our earnings slowed. I mean, our earnings dropped by 80%, 75%. And the economy didn't drop that much. That's the pendulum effect I'm talking about. So, and right now, I think that we're at the bottom of the cycle. And the optimism that I see is that I believe now that we're going to be coming out of that that bottom that we've been in, uh, that's been building through 2023. As I look at the first quarter, that's January, February, March, the order patterns. I believe that, that we're seeing an improvement. We're seeing a little bit of traction on pricing and so forth. I don't think it's going to be a severe turnaround, but it'll be a gradual throughout 2024. So 2023 and 2024, obviously kind of the bottom of the trough for the company. It creates a level of uncertainty for our people. What what do you say to Huntsman Associates that listen to the earnings call, read, you know, four to six quarters in a row of a tough environment and feel insecure and uncertain? What is your message to them? First of all, step back and let's stay focused on the basic fundamentals of this company. Number one is we want to make sure that people are safe that they're focused on the reliability of their operations and that they're focused on the safety of their operations. Number two, I think that we want to make sure that as much of the volatility that's going on around us, we feel like there's a lot of upheaval and so forth. The vast majority of our people are going to be doing this, I'm not going to say the same job because a lot of people can get promoted and so forth, but they're going to be working with this company for many years to come. And if, if that's the case, we need to make sure that we treat each other with respect and many of our capacities and our roles. We work, the people with whom we work on a daily basis, we spend more time with them than we do a lot of, than the time we spend with our loved ones at home. So we want to treat people with respect and with dignity. And then we want to stay focused. The number three priority, I would say, is we want to stay focused on what do we need to do to return capital to shareholders. Think of somebody out there that's gotten money. If you're a fund manager, you're, you're investing your retirement payment, you're a, a, a day trader in the stock, you've got tens of thousands of different places to invest your money. 
why pick Huntsman? And that's a question that I get asked every day virtually from investors when I'm on the road, when I'm spending time with investors, why should I be putting money in your company? And people invest in stability, they invest in creativity, and they invest in in companies that, that can perform better than their peers. And I think that's why over the last couple of years, we've had, we certainly have had better performance than our peers in this industry. You talked also in the press release about business decisions that were made in previous years that have enabled the company to be in the position that it's in right now while it is weathering the storm. I started Huntsman in 2016, been here almost eight years. And as I look back over that time, we are an entirely different company than we were back then. We've divested assets. We've made acquisitions. We have an investment rating. Talk about those decisions as you look back over six, eight years, and how did a decision that got made in 2017, 18, 20, 21, during the depths of the pandemic, allow us to weather the last 18 to 24 months in a down market? Yeah, I'll even go back later than that. I mean, just just think of the, or earlier than that, I should say, just think of the arc that this company has been on. This is a company started in 83, essentially producing the raw materials for throwaway plastics. And if there were analysts that called us then, they didn't because we weren't a public company. But had they called us, they would have been asking us about what sort of trends do you see in throwaway plastics? How many knives, forks, spoons, and so forth are, is McDonald's using? Those would have been the questions that we'd have, have been asked. Now, the single segment that, that was asked about most today was aerospace. The thing that we've gone as a company of making the raw materials for disposable knives, forks, and spoons at McDonald's to supplying multiple tons per aircraft that Airbus and Boeing are making. And we have virtually few, if any, competitors in this field because of our technological and our uh, economic prowess in this area. So think of that. Just think of that over the last couple of decades of going from a company that makes plastic forks to a company that's making jet airliners. In that, I think that a lot of people have the misperception that the chemical industry is old, it's lethargic, and it doesn't innovate. You got to get into high tech. I'd like to see, you probably would have to go to high tech, maybe pharma, to find companies that have innovated and created as much as this company has in the last 30 or 40 years. And I don't say that egotistically. I say that that is what this industry is all about, innovation and creativity. That being the case, I've often said, if you take any period of time this company and you go back five years and you look at what the company was five years ago, so I I take that right now, go back to 2018, 2018, 2019. And had we been the same company today, if we were the same company today, we were back just five years ago, our stock price, I believe, would probably be in the mid to high single digits in value. And so that back then, that's ethylene oxide. No, no, that's, that's, even, that's even after that. That's when we had textile effects. We, we'd have almost a billion dollars of sales generating very little, if any, EBITDA today. That was before the acquisition of the recent acquisitions we've had in, in the advanced materials and the building out of advanced materials. So you just look at, at some of those areas where it was, it was being able to close on our intermediates business, our surfactants business, and bringing in billions of dollars. So we've become investment grade in the last couple of years. I mean, if we, were, if we had to weather the, the economic storm that we're in today with the portfolio that we had five years ago, yes, we'd still be in business, but I bet you our equity value would probably be 75% less than it is today. So the real question then before me and before I think every associate in this company is where are we going to be in five years because I believe in five years from now, we're going to be looking back at 2024 when we're at, at 2030. And we're going to be asking ourselves, wow, how did we ever survive <laughs> the portfolio we had back in 2024? And that, I'd ask the obvious questions, where are we going? What are we doing? And do we have the wherewithal? Do we have the financial means? Do we have the balance sheet? Do we have the creativity? Do we have the openness to be able to continue to advance, to be continue to evolve as a company and continue to improve? And that's the greatest, that's, that's free enterprise. That's, that's what competition does. So that, that's our biggest challenge. When you look out over the next five years and think about that change in the company and that change in the portfolio, and I know you can't predict the future, but what 
as you look at the external world and marketplace, what does that look like? Do you have any idea? Yes, I think that's going to be a lot more high tech. I think companies are going to be rewarded for their creativity. People are going to be looking at technologies like Marilon that we're developing today. I think in five years from now, we will look back and say, wow, I remember when Marilon was our biggest production of Marilon was on top of a, a table. I think people are, are going to be looking back and, and saying they weren't in adhesives. They weren't in a lot of, of the areas of composites and specialty amines and so forth, downstream MDI applications and so forth that we are in, uh, that will be in, in a couple of years. We've also got some large macroeconomic issues. When I look at the overall energy values and costs in Europe, something's got to give. We've got a cost structure there. And it's not just Huntsman, it's, it's Europe in general. How do they compete with the rest of the world when their cost structure is an order of magnitude 40, 50% higher than the rest of the world? These are not insurmountable issues, but they're issues that have to be called out and have to be addressed. I want to take a trip around the world in a little bit, but before we do that, I want to shift gears and I want to talk about something that I know you hate, which is talk about you. As you know, I've had a month to prepare and plan for this podcast, and I've done a bit of crowdsourcing inside the company to find out what people want to know about Peter Huntsman, kind of away from the business, the person that you are. And to be honest with you, the responses were fantastic, and they kind of ranged all over the place. So I have a list here, and I would ask that you try to answer in 30 seconds or less. Are you uh, ready? Are you up for this? Yes, and if I don't answer, it's because I just don't think people really care. What are the most important lessons that you learned from your mother and father? My mother, I learned indomitable patience, which she had with nine children. I learned the value of diet and exercise. I grew up thinking that white sugar was in soda was akin to heroin and cocaine. <laughs> You know, and I, I probably it was, was overbearing with my own children when it came to those sort of things. From my father, I learned, I don't know if I incorporate as well as my father. I hope I do to some regards. I learned a, a, an undying sense of optimism, hard work, belief in, in the American system. Now here, here's a guy that grew up without indoor plumbing until he was like seven, seven, eight years old. And he made the American dream. And anybody that remembered or had the chance to work with my father, I think they, they saw an indomitable personality. How did he shape you as a business leader? Wow, that's, that's really tough to answer in, in 30 seconds. You could take more. I have never said this in more than two or three people, but I quit my job three times. I wrote and signed two letters of resignation that I submitted to my father. We didn't always get along. Maybe, maybe we're too similar in certain areas. But yeah, dad had this incredible vision, incredible drive, and he could be a really tough individual to work with. And he, he gave me great opportunities, obviously. I mean, look where I am. I mean, you know, he opened a lot of doors for me, as he did for a lot of people. He shaped me with, don't ever give up. You, you climb that mountain, no matter what's in front of you. And always have a sense of optimism and always be ready to fight. There are things in this, this life that are worth fighting over, your, your beliefs, your core principles. People try to hurt your family, they try to hurt your business. You should be willing to fight for these things. It wasn't always easy, but I, I'm glad that my father lived as long as he did because the last couple of years of his life, we got along incredibly well. I think we got along well my entire life, but we, we particularly got along well the last you know, couple of years. When he passed away, I was one of the last people to see him and communicate with him alive. I didn't feel this, this need that I had to connect with him. I didn't feel need that I had to tell my father I loved him because uh, he knew I loved him and I knew he loved me in spite of what we'd, we'd kind of been through, you know, that there was this, this, this great connection. When you were driving a truck around Utah, 20 years old, did you ever think that you would become the CEO of a big global company like you are today? No, no. I'm not sitting here saying I, I was poor and humble or anything. I, and my first, first house was 60,000 bucks and had a $35,000 mortgage. And, and I remember sitting in the backyard with my wife, uh, looking at the mountain ranges uh, in Utah, telling her in 30 years, this house in 30 years is going to be paid for. 
will own this thirty thousand more dollar mortgage free and clear. And we just we just thought we we're masters of the universe. I mean, it was it was, it was a, a simple life. Well, no, it, I mean, I think if you'd have gone to my father in nineteen eighty three and said, "Do you ever think that you would have been you know built up?" I don't, maybe he would have said yes, but I I doubt it. If you never went into the family business and the whole chemical thing never happened. What do you think you'd be doing today? Kev, that's a, it's a great question. I have, I have no idea. I've, I've honestly never thought about it. I, I think whatever I'd have done, I, I would have lost myself in the work. And I, I've always enjoyed working. I've always had good health. And I've always been blessed with these things. And, I, I just, and I've always enjoyed the people I work with. Every, every single one of them. Good, bad, and different people that were, that were tough on me, whatever. I, 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 I learned something from everybody. So whatever I would have gone, I, I would have been happy. I was I was immensely happy driving a, a semi truck across the western U.S. I, I I loved it. What is it like raising eight children? You're learning something every day. I have uh, undying admiration for my wife because I I traveled a, a great deal when she was raising most of those kids most of the hours. It was a true partnership, but every one of them was was unique in a different way had their challenges in a different way and and they they've just as a as a father i mean as i as i get to a point i'm no i'm not announcing my retirement or anything <laughs> I, I mean, i'm far closer to the end of life and end of my career than i am at the midpoint of any of this stuff and you you look back and i mean those those certainly are the things that matter most in life if you could have dinner with anybody in history who would it be I, I love American history, and I do anything like to meet Abraham Lincoln, some of the founding fathers. I think Lincoln probably went through more trials and adversity. Ha- presiding over the American Civil War had to have been the most trying job in modern history in the last two, two, three hundred years. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine what he went through in the Civil War. I couldn't it'd just be amazing. When you're the CEO of a company, you have reams of information coming at you all the time. How do you stay informed and how do you determine what information really matters? I, I rely very heavily on my team. One of the reasons why I am a very good chief executive officer, now hear me out on this because I know it sounds very narcissistic what I just said. One of the reasons why I'm a very good chief executive officer is because I can surround myself with people that are better than me, which is something that is very easy for me to do. I rely on those individuals. I, I, I think I communicate on a regular basis with those individuals and with their direct reports. I like to get a sense from, from others what's going on, why it's happening, and listen to their human perspective on things rather than just reading data and reading economic statistics. Favorite book ever. And what is a good recent book you recommend? I read or listen to probably a book every two weeks, every 10 to 14 days. I couldn't recommend a book. There are they're just, they're just too many of them. I'm not a terribly religious person, but the Bible had a profound influence on me, probably because I needed it. <laughs> um, still do. But the the stories, the mythologies, the the truth, the, the teachings, and so forth. I love reading biographies on individuals. And I think I think war and human conflict probably is is the apex of of human endurance. And so, reading about how people made decisions, acted under pressure, did what they did under enormous pressure as generals, presidents, leaders, and so forth. I, I take a lot of inspiration. I, I can't read enough on a lot of those individuals and subjects. You talked earlier about being kind of at the latter stage of your career and statistically speaking, the latter stage of your life. What do you regret? Are there things that you regret? Are there things you wish you did differently, maybe as a business leader? As a dad, as a husband, I mean, we, everybody has regrets to some extent. Well, oh, sure. Ke- Kevin, they're, they're simply too numerous to mention. You know, I, I wish you, you, after eight kids, goodness. I mean, I, I remember I just worried so much about my oldest daughter, Jacqueline, how, you know, how she'd ever make it unless she was number one in her class, unless she was the first one, you know, in school, she couldn't be late. And by the eighth time, the eighth one comes along, you're just kind of like, well, they've got a pulse, they get <laughs> dressed, they can feed themselves by the time they're 12. And eh, they're okay. Yeah. And it's not that you're just, you're just, maybe the pendulum swings a bit too far uh, by the time the youngest one rolls around. But, but those are all lessons of life. I mean, I wish I'd have applied myself more in school. I wish I'd have been more patient. I wish I, I mean, but, but 
if, if you were that way, if you can look back when you're my age at 60 and look back and say, this is why I wish I'd done it at 16, then you wouldn't have learned anything. Right. You know, you'd, so those it's the are, course those, of life. It is. Those are the, this arc of life. If, if I had to regret, if I had to change something, it's probably things that I said to other people that, that hurt their feelings, that were unnecessary, unfeeling, and, and maybe that were inspired on my part out of my own insecurity and so forth. I wish I could go back and, and take back some of those sort of things. But as far as you know, the mistakes you make in life, the experiences you have in life and so forth. Look, that, that's, that's what mortality is all about. That's what life's all about. How has your leadership style changed over time? I, I'm much better today at delegating and hopefully a little more patient than I was. I mean, I used to just want to know every little detail, try to do it myself and, and make sure that I understood every facet. I, I, I do a much better job today. I have to, relying on other people, whether it's in the foundations, whether it's in the corporation, so forth. And you also find out, too, that I, I continue to learn more because I'm, I'm more open-minded and, and, uh, and I'm willing to, to delegate. Delegate's much harder than people think it is. Uh, but when you do it and you do it right, and I'm still learning that, uh, when you do it, you do it right. It's, it's a great learning experience for both, both sides. And delegation comes down to trust. You talked earlier about having people around you with skills that you don't have. That ultimately is about trust. It's about trust. And it's also about, uh, look, I, I went to university for about five, five, six months and just got tired and fed up with the whole thing. Never went back. I taught myself and I experienced things. I, I mean, I... I remember one of the first letters I wrote to a customer my father saw it. He sent it. Somebody got a copy of it. I think from I was using his assistant or somebody to type it up. He sent it back to me. It had all these red checks, circles, and every you know it's like your teacher would send back to you when you're in the sixth grade. I didn't know the difference between a noun and a verb and so forth. I mean, it's just it, I was so embarrassed when my father wrote that back. I went to the University of Utah bookstore and I bought like five books on basic English and started reading. When do, you, when do you end a sentence? I mean, I was 18 years old, 19 years old. When do you end a sentence? When do you, you know, when do you put a comma? What are those little dot comma things on top of each other? And what are, what are those things for? And it, it's, uh, I mean, things I should have learned in school, but I didn't because I didn't either apply myself or attend. Yeah, you eventually got to learn those things. So I, I, I wish I'd learned them sooner, but I also had a fun time when I should have been in class. So I can't, I can't look back and say... Could have, would have, should have. After so many years in business, what have you learned about people and human nature? Pe- people intrinsically want to succeed if you if you give them the right environment. Not everybody. Look, they're they're bad people in the world, and they're corrupt people in the world, and there's there there's bad things that that happen. But by and large, I don't think anybody comes. To, well, ninety nine point nine percent of our people in this company don't come to work to get hurt. They don't come to work to commit fraud. They don't come to work to offend somebody. And so when those things happen, I've got to ask myself, where did the system break down? Why does somebody feel like they need to come lash out at a fellow worker? Why does somebody feel like they've got to take a risk and get hurt? Were they feeling like their production matrix or or targets that are unrealistic that they've got to meet? What did we do wrong in the system? Because I, I think by and large, people come to work to succeed. They want to be... Uh, re- recognized in the sense that they want somebody to listen to their ideas and views and, and value those. That's tough to have that environment all the time. What do you do on the weekend? What's your typical weekend? It's a good time for me to exercise, which I typically do every morning. And I enjoy cooking. I like to, uh, every Saturday I, I cook for my wife, usually Sunday as well. But Saturday I'd I like to, to think of a, of a cuisine, Lebanese, Indian, Italian, Spanish, I'm just thinking the last couple of weeks, German, and try to pick a cuisine and take a couple hours, learn about it, learn about the ingredients. It's I enjoy, great detail. I enjoy cooking. It's great detail. Enjoy cooking. You've been CEO of Huntsman for, I think, over 20 years, a president or CEO. What, motiv- what still motivates you? What gets you up every day with a fire in your belly to get to the office or get to a town hall? What is it? The people. Yeah. That, that's, that's really all it is. I mean, I, I've told the board, look, when I need an alarm clock to wake up in the morning or I get up and I think that it's just drudgery coming to work or I get tired, I'll leave. I couldn't think of anything worse than a board member coming to me and saying, Peter, you're slowing down. You're just not what you used to be. It's Maybe it's time for you to move on. Yeah. Uh, I should know that before anybody else knows that. And I still feel just as excited, even more so, 
when I think about what we're doing, where we're going, and the recovery that we're in, all these things, that's, that's truly inspiring. What gives you hope for the future? Human ingenuity and innovation. I used to always fear the future. And again, now that I'm a grandfather, I'm expecting number 19. We are an incredible species, Homo sapiens. You know, since I was a kid, we, w- we were going to, in the 1970s, we were going to have an ice age. And then we were going to die of acid rain. And then it was deforestation. And then it was uh, global warming. And it was climate change. And now today, you know, we, we use the word existential threat. There's an existential threat of our debt, existential threat of our, of our uh, climate. Uh, you know, we got five years of life left in us and so forth. And it's just, you know, you, you kind of step back and think this is nonsense. We're, we're, we're an incredibly resilient and creative species that do best when the chips are down. They get too much my father and me, but I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. But, but we, we've got more people around the world with more wealth, more education, more people live under some form of, of, of governance, of self-determination. More women have access to education and, and uh, health services than ever before. We've still got a long ways to go, but you look at where we are today, more people today die of suicide than die of wars. More people die of overeating than undereating. More people die... Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, just, you just go through the basic statistics of humanity and, and, and the history of our species. We've never been as prosperous, as lucky and as blessed as we are today. It's astounding. It's, an, it's an astounding time to live it. You think about artificial intelligence and what we're going to be doing, the frontiers of, of solving cancer and mental health issues and, and so forth. I, I think that life may not be much longer, but the quality of life is going to be far superior than anything we can imagine. So speaking of life, let's say... Tomorrow you wake up and you find out it's my last day on earth. What's your last meal? I was thinking probably the Waffle House stacked, smothered, <laughs> covered, <laughs> and diced. <laughs> with all that sugar that your mom said you could yeah, eat? Yeah, yeah, but, but with Pop-Tarts on the side. <laughs> all right, I like that. Last question on the rapid fire, which was, I thought, the funniest question from one of our associates. Do you take out the trash? Well, my wife certainly doesn't. So, yes, of course I do. <laughs> That's what I thought. I, I take out the trash. Recycling is on Fridays and the trash is on Tuesdays and Fridays. So, yes. And then they come at, at about 7.05 in the morning. And you can't do it the night before. The raccoons will come get it. So, yes. Well, I appreciate you getting through all those questions because they did come from our employees. And I am proud to say that we got through them all. So let's go back. We talked a little bit earlier about Europe. And I'd like, to, I'd like for you to take us around the world And our industry and our company are impacted by global events that are often entirely out of our control. And when you look around the world today, it seems as unstable as it's been maybe since after 9-11, but there's a balance of power politics going on in the world that kind of likens itself to the Cold War. And we're, we're kind of living in wild times, despite all the positivity in the world that you discussed earlier. Let's start with Europe and we'll go east from there. You were in Antwerp earlier in the week at a intimate industry roundtable with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and you had a multitude of energy intensive industries basically waving the red flag to the most senior politician in Europe saying, this is the end if there isn't a course correction. How do you see that in the next six, 12 months, two years, three years? I mean, how, how bad is it? Is it just rhetoric or is it real? Well, before you get into that, I, I take exception with the premise that you, that you started this segment with, that we're kind of in a, in a Cold War sort of environment today. I, I, I just, I simply don't see that. In terms of balance of power politics? I grew up in, in when we literally feared the idea that the Soviets could atomize the United States and 21 and a half minutes in a mass nuclear launch. The movies like, you know, the, the day after and so forth that were, you know, the duck and cover exercise I did as a in kids under the desk. Yeah. Kids under the desk. I mean, I, I, we, we, you know, our biggest adversary, we, we say in the world right now is China. They're also our biggest trade partner. Right. We never had that with the Soviet Union. I mean, we have, we have Chinese nationals by the hundreds of thousands that live in the United States, study here, that come here. We can go there. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are conflicts. Uh, yes, we don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. But, you know, I, I went to China for the first time in 1978, and everybody was running around with a Mao jacket and a cap with a red star on it, and they all had the same footwear and so forth. You look at, at China since then, 
you go to China today and aside from the Chinese symbols that you'll see on signs and so forth, you're seeing Starbucks, McDonald's, you're seeing Western Apple and Nike. And I mean, it's just, it's astounding. I didn't, I didn't see that stuff when I went to Russia and Soviet Union the first time. So yeah, we're so interconnected. I was going to say that inter, interdependency that yeah, you're describing, that's a, good, that's a good thing for it, security. It is. it is. And so we, I like to think of business today as something of a modern day diplomacy. Largely what we have today is, is a trade, you know, from the Bretton Woods Accord after World War II. It's, it's worked. It has its faults and its fallacies, but we've, you know, we've, we've, we've done okay. So I, I guess I'd, I'd be a little more optimistic. But on to Europe. Sorry. No, it's, that's fine. I mean, let's, let's just stay in China while we're there. I mean, what worries you as somebody that's been doing business in China for almost four decades and has lived that arc of Western capital, Western, both financial capital, intellectual capital, human capital coming into China, I would argue being the primary driver of its modernization. I mean, you've lived that. What worries you about that relationship between China and I would just say the U.S. and Europe? As we look ahead in the, in the you know, next five years. Yeah, I, I, as I look at China, I, I worry about the, the political leaders on both sides and the decisions made with the respective groups, the emotions and the rhetoric. It, look, every person that has run uh, and, and gotten any traction running for the presidency of the United States in the last 40 years has all Democrat, Republican, have all said, I'm going to get tough with China, I'm going to get tough. And then they get in there. They find out how much we're doing with China, how dependent they are on us and how dependent we are on them. And then they, they, want, to have a, they want to have a summit meeting and they want to get together and they want to talk. And you know, I've, I've traveled in a lot of areas of China and I've done it for the last 40 years. And I've never felt threatened. I've never felt like the people there hate me because I'm an American. They look at me because I'm an American. The opposite. I, I have felt that way, by the way, in, in other areas of the world where, where there truly is conflict. But I think the average Chinese citizen and the average American citizen, the average American citizen probably has a, a quite a bit of respect for the, the average person living in China. They may not like communism and the average Chinese may not like our unfettered capitalism, but I think the average person in China probably has a monicum of respect and so forth for the average American. I think that's vice versa. I think we, I think the, 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 the people get along far better than, than the leaders do. And, the, and usually once the leaders have a summit or something, it's not like, I've rarely have I seen a, a summit take place between U.S. and Chinese leaders where after the summit, the relationship worsens. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Europe, the red flag we talked about with industry leaders. What was your takeaway from that meeting on Tuesday in Antwerp? And is it, is it rhetoric or is it structural reality that, that without course correction is going to continue? and make it untenable. If, if Europe continues on a path to reach net zero, and I'm still a bit unclear, go look it up as to what does net zero mean. Just do a Wikipedia on net zero. And I bet, I bet there's not one single concrete definition as to what z net zero means. We, we don't even know what that means. We don't even know how we get to net zero. I mean, seriously. I mean, we are, we're when, carbon life forms. We emit carbon When ourselves. you say it like that, it's kind of amazing to think that sovereign governments and whole continents have organized their economies around this idea. Because I, th I think the average person, I mean, you're a CEO of a company. You don't even know what it means. It's not just their economies, Kevin. It's, it's, it's the mentality. It's a philosophy. Now, again, I'm, I like to consider myself as an, an environmentalist and so forth. I, I want clean air. I want clean water and so forth. But this idea that, that net zero, not net 5%, 10%, a reduction of 10% or whatever, but net zero by a certain day, by 2050, I'm always leery when targets and dates are set with, you know, like 50 or 100 or 150, not 2052, but 2050, January 1, 2050. We have to meet it by that point or the world comes to an end. How many times over the last 20 years have I heard that we've got five years left, left to live? How many times last... 20 years, there's an existential threat that the polar ice caps are gone, snow's gone, 100-year drought coming to California. Okay, I, and I'm not saying that, that we ought to have unfettered emissions. Nobody, nobody's arguing for that sort of stuff. I feel like European leaders are just completely detached. When you talk to them and you talk to them about what does net zero get you, how do you get there and still have a competitive, thriving economy? 
they keep going back to this idea, well, we need to innovate. We need to innovate. We need to invest in R&D. The physics behind this, I mean, just in the, the, new, the, the, the chemical industry alone, you're talking about the construction in excess of the chemical industry alone, in excess of 500 nuclear facilities. They'll have to be built across Europe. And if you throw into that cement and EVs, the amount of electricity that will be needed, the amount, then this is to electrolyze water into hydrogen and green hydrogen, all these buzzwords you hear over there. You're, you're talking close to 900 nuclear facilities are going to be needed. That's just not reality. Nobody's going to build that many. I think when you talk about the idea of net zero, I think what people have interpreted it to mean, and when I say people, I mean policymakers and some business leaders, it has really become this idea that we're not going to have sources of energy because you look at Germany, they've canceled their nuclear energy system. They don't extract fossil fuels. I mean, it really has morphed into this idea that you can have a modern economy and modern life without hydrocarbons. There's no other explanation for it. Well, forget for just a second what I mean means for this. I'd like to see some of these leaders just just by an example, go one week, go one, go go 48 hours without any hydrocarbons. Any food that came from hydrocarbons, any clothing that came from hydrocarbons, means of communication, impossible. transportation, for 48 it's hours. It's impossible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's literally impossible. So when people say we shouldn't be permitting any more oil or gas and so forth, we shouldn't be, you know, that, that somehow, you know, we have to get beyond petroleum. Okay, to what? Wind is going to play a role in that. Solar is going to play a role in that. But those are all things that are built with hydrocarbons. They're powered by hydrocarbons. They're, the power is distributed by hydrocarbons. They're maintained by hydrocarbons. They operate because they have hydrocarbons and mined materials and, and refined ores and so forth. I just don't get this, uh, this idea that we've got this target that's out there, this destination we want to get to, but we have no idea how we're going to get there. And that's that's the part that's so frustrating. It's self-immolation. It, it, well, we're, and Economically. And, that, and that's what we're seeing right now in places like Germany. So it's, it's hugely frustrating. And so where's Germany going? Well, they're now importing more vehicles. And you look at over the next five years, what's projected to be, they're importing more parts for, for cars, a few cars that will be built in Germany, and they're importing finished vehicles. And what's that going to do to the workers? What's that going to do the, to the middle class? It's, it's just going to ravage it's it. It's going to lower I, their standards I, of life. It is. And, the, and you've been there with me, Kevin. We went and met with politicians. We've done this before. And they readily admit the next generation is prepared to be poorer than them, than the present generation in leadership. I, I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe anybody's raising their kids with the idea that you're going to somehow be the first generation in human history to devolve. I don't believe it either. And I think where it's going to manifest itself is at the ballot box. And you're already seeing it well, all over Europe. So the faster, the better, because once these industries leave, they're not coming back. Once you shut down a 40 year old chemical plant, once you stop investing in industry, I'm trying to think back is the when industry left and then when it came back, I'm not talking about when industry has been destroyed, like in Second World War or something like that. But when did industry leave a continent because it was just it just couldn't compete? And then that same industry came back 20 years later. You know, um, the only uh, or I shouldn't say the only, but one of the few examples that I have found on that point is is the steel deindustrialization of Pennsylvania in kind of the 80s and 90s when all of that went to China. And what ultimately restored Western Pennsylvania and the, the Ohio River Valley was Hydraulic fracturing. But it wasn't. And the Marcella show. It wasn't steel. It wasn't, no, it wasn't steel. steel. That's, my, that's my point. It's a different steel. industry. So, so they could have come back 20, 30 years later and said, okay, we're now going to let steel manufacturers come back and they can, they can emit whatever they want. I'm not saying they should have, but they can emit whatever they want. That, that wouldn't have brought them back. No, not at all. Let's move east towards a place that does not seem to believe in net zero, despite what they say. And that's the Middle East, which has this enormous strategic advantage of hydrocarbon production and is a source to the world of feedstock and petroleum and natural gas, but it's also an unstable place. When you look at the Middle East from a chemical sector perspective, what do you see? I believe that in the course of the next decade, particularly if Europe continues to go the route that it is going, the Middle East will become the source of energy intensive raw materials to Europe. What I mean by that is a company like Airbus will still be building planes in Toulouse and in Hamburg and finishing them off and so forth. The basic raw materials and formulations for that will still be coming from our plant in Switzerland and so forth. But the raw materials that we are buying 
will be coming from places like the Middle East. The, perhaps the raw materials, I mean, I, uh, how many MDI plants are going to be built in continental Europe? Or the future MDI plants, I believe, will most likely be built in the Middle East, China, or North America. And then you'll import crude MDI. You'll import the energy-intensive raw materials will come into Europe. And that means that, the, that Europe then becomes more dependent on the diplomatic and the trade relations for good or for bad. I mean, look, they became very dependent on Russia. That, that, look how that turned out for them. So the Middle East, I think, that is going to, to assuming that they can, they can maintain a monocle of stability, which I think they're actually doing. The Middle East is far more stable today than it has been in, in decades. I think it's going to be a major source of energy, a major source of raw materials, and a major source of energy efficiencies for particularly, not just the world, but particularly Europe. How do you think about India? You've been doing business there on and off for decades. India is a very tough country in which to compete. I say that because to, to import into India and the distribution system, the infrastructure and so forth, you really can't have a thriving business in India unless, you know, the India, Indian economy is dominated in its various sectors by a reliance in refining and, and chemicals, by a Tata and, and you know, computer data systems and so forth. They're, I don't want to call them chables, but India is a tough place. You're, you're either in India all the way, or you're kind of just playing around the edges. And I think we've done a very good job playing around the edges. We've got some, some great assets there. We've got even better people there. Yeah, but the, the question is, 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 would a company like ours ever go into India and build a world-scale chemical plant and compete against a Tata or a Reliance or something like that? And I, I, I don't see us doing that unless it was, it was through some sort of partnership. Let's talk about the United States as a location for capital investment and how you see the future here. And you could you could also talk about just broadly North American as well. Yeah. So let me just say one other thing about India. So I, I believe firmly that the, the, there's going to be three pockets of energy around the world. China is going to be very reliant on coal and, and they're going to be reliant on coal for, for decades to come. Let's be real about this. Uh, China burns more coal today than the rest of the world combined. And the, they're building a coal-burning power plant at the rate of about one every two and a half to three days. And so if, if you look at it in those sort of terms, China's going to be reliant on its, its base load of energy coming from coal. The Middle East is going to be oil, and the United States is going to be oil, but mostly natural gas. India is very interesting because India's got cheap labor. It's got, it's got a lot of people there and very hardworking people. But what's their source of energy? They don't have any oil. They don't have any gas. They have a lot of coal. And uh, they're not afraid to use it. And they're not afraid to use it. And so Indians will, will be, still remain as one of the largest oil consumers from Iran, from Russia, from any place where they can get a reliable source of supply. And, but more importantly, I th they, like anybody else, are going to want two things. They want, they're going to want a reliable source of energy, and they're going to want a cheap source of energy. And for India, yes, they'll build the, the occasional wind turbine, some solar, so build some, some nuclear. But just, what, 48 hours, 72 hours ago, they announced that they were uh, doing the permitting and opening up of 42 new coal pits. I think that's rather sad because I'm not a big fan of coal, but if you're in India and you need cheap power and cheap electricity and people want to improve their lives. It's kind of tough for us to sit here in the U.S. and say, can't do it. Can't do it without our gas. And I think you saw that after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when the U.S. and Europe really tried to squeeze India on Russian imports. Yeah. How did and that the, the yeah. Indians said, no way. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take care of our people. Didn't, didn't work out at all. So, so yeah, when we go around the world, I think it's important to ask, what is your, what's your basic source of energy? And that is, also your basic source of, of manufacturing, of building stuff. And if you don't have that, and you don't have that as part of your economic policy, then you are an importer of goods and services. The United States is incredibly fortunate in that we have the geography in that wind will be a, a vital component of our energy supply. Solar in the southern parts of the Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and so forth, solar will be a vital part. It's too bad that the green movement killed the nuclear industry back in the 1960s. Had, had we been able to keep a nuclear movement going, you would have seen the United States today with hundreds of, of nuclear facilities instead of coal facilities. But we can thank the green movement for putting all this coal in, taking out nuclear, which I've 
I don't know if I've ever heard anybody talk about that and the consequences of that. No, but I, I, I'm very bullish longer term. I, I think the biggest threat the United States has when I step back and I look at it, I'm not going to talk about the socio issues in the United States, but just from a, a pure economic manufacturing point of view, I think our, our federal debt is, is our single biggest vulnerability we have. We're paying over a trillion dollars just in interest on the debt in the United States. That's, that's going to be, uh, I don't worry about our energy. I don't worry about our manufacturing. I don't worry about our long-term competitiveness, our ability to bring out new technologies. I mean, uh, all that's going to continue to come from the United States. Very bullish about those sort of things. But our, our debt will just, will just crush us. It'll crush our, our economic system if we continue on the path that we're on right now. In the last year, you have stepped out into the public realm as an industry leader on various topics like climate change and energy policy, European deindustrialization. You've even testified before Congress. You've been critical of people like Mike Bloomberg who are trying to impede chemical sector manufacturing. What has spurred you to speak out more forcefully on some of these issues? And why do you think more industry leaders are reticent to do so? I, I can't speak about other industry leaders. Perhaps it's, it's uh, well, I say I can't, and then I'll say I'll make comments. So, yes, I will comment. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a fear of being canceled. It's a fear of having, I think, perhaps a lot of CEOs see themselves a year or two away from retirement. And why get into a, a big fight when I'm so close to, you know, walking away with, with my gold statuette or watch or whatever? I see a genuine threat that I never have seen before of the survival of American manufacturing. And if you want to see where we're heading, look at Europe today. I do not believe that we'll get there, but I, and I don't think, I'm not riding off Europe. I want to be very clear on this. Uh, we continue to have great assets and people and so forth in Europe, but it is going to, it's going to take a lot of work to, to turn that ship around. When I look at the U.S., there are people like Mike Bloomberg that want to stop progress this is the guy that's got multiple private jets, planes. He, this is a guy that commutes from New York to the Bahamas for, to his, his home there and lives in Bermuda or someplace. Multiple homes around and you know, is worth billions of dollars and made his billions of dollars selling plastic uh, monitors that people put that sell business information that, that trade on the information of capitalism, for heaven's sakes. And somehow... Rank hypocrisy. Know, it is. It's just, it's rank hypocrisy. Can... He'd be putting his money to have a cleaner, more accountable, more transparent industry. Sure, that, that's great. But this whole idea that we're going to go beyond petrochemicals, okay, to what? I mean, nobody can answer that question. Stone Age? It's pure denial of basic science. That's what it is. You talked about philanthropy regarding Mike Bloomberg, although what he believes is philanthropy. Since your dad passed away, you've taken a leadership role related to the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and more recently, the Huntsman Mental Health Institute. You also talked earlier about being optimistic about the future and human nature. Talk about some of the recent advances in cancer treatment and what gives you hope in the fight against cancer. And then also, what have you learned in the last few years as your family has gotten more engaged on mental health issues? Because that's the scourge that you always say every family deals with it. Everybody knows somebody that's struggling Today, I have the opportunity to, to be the chairman and chief executive officer of the Huntsman Cancer Foundation, not institute, foundation. So the foundation is what raises money to help keep the Huntsman Cancer Institute, the hospital research center and so forth, going. We don't own the institute. We don't manage the institute. And when I say I, I also would... I mean, my siblings do a great deal of work and lifting and so forth and that. I, I don't want to act like this is a, a one-man band. What is going on in cancer today is absolutely phenomenal. Immune therapy, that is basically getting your own immune system. The reason why cancer is so dangerous is that your immune system doesn't detect it. Your immune system doesn't know how to fight it. With a virus, eventually your immune system will battle it. It'll, and that's, that's why you get sick when you get a virus, is your immune system is basically using all of your energy to, to combat this virus. Well, your immune system can't identify cancer cells in your body. And when it does, if it can, it can wipe them out. And that's what immunotherapy is in a very simplistic 
uh, forms, attacking those proteins, those DNAs that are the cancer cell itself. So for the first time, literally in history, we have people that uh, it used to be that pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancers, well, it used to be that breast cancer was virtually a, a, uh, was a death sentence. We have people today that, that are alive and have no trace of cancer that had pancreatic cancer. Ten years ago, that was, Kevin, that was impossible. And I'm not saying that we can cure all these things, but we're starting to see the cracks. And I believe that in my grandchildren's lifetimes, that, that cancer will largely be a thing of the past. Now, we look at something like mental health. I think that we're probably 50 years further along in the research in cancer than we are in mental health. We know cancer is a genetic disease. We know, in theory, how to cure a lot of it. We know how to prevent it through smoking, uh, cessation, through the environment, everything from uh, too much sun and so forth. I mean, we, we, we know a lot of that. Mental health, we, we know more about the far side of the moon than we do the human brain mm-hmm. and what, what causes emotional instability. The, the, forgive me for getting personal here. I had a very close family member that, you know, that, that was seeing people, people that were deceased and seeing people you know, that, that weren't there. And I, I talked to one of the psychiatrists that uh, we were working with. And they said, they reminded me, well, every night you see people, every night you commune with people, every night you dream. The difference between your brain and the subconscious and the conscience is, from your brain matter is, is like a, a, a fraction of 1%, the difference between being in the subconscious and the conscious mind. And all, all this person very near and dear to you is, is experiencing is what you see in the subconscious, what you see at night dreaming. They're seeing it in the daytime. And I mean, when it was explained yeah. to me, and he explained it to me in much greater detail, made far more sense what I'm trying to do very clumsily. But it made this great deal of sense. That it humanizes brain, it a yeah, bit. Yeah, your brain can yeah. be off a fraction of 1%. And you're seeing things that, that how many times have you, have you woken up falling out of a plane or crashing or you know, doing something that's cataclysmic? When you think about it like that, you don't actually, it doesn't have a negative perception. No. And so it used to be when I was a kid, I remember you, you, with cancer, somebody had cancer. Well, can I kiss that person? Am I going to get cancer? It was a death sentence. I don't want to talk to him about it because it's so depressing and so forth. Now somebody gets cancer and we put a ribbon on, we're doing support and we're, we're you know, th- this is how do we beat it? Somebody comes to work in the morning and they're feeling anxiety. They're feeling they're feeling depressed. They're feeling a, a manic depression. They're feeling, uh, you know, a, a mental health illness. Do we feel that we can go to the person next to us and say, Kevin, I'm having a tough day today? The stigma. Yeah. Can, can, I, can, I, can I talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes and just, you know, I, I, need, I need a friend. I need, I need some reassurance. And, and yes, I'm not saying you can just talk yourself out of, of depression or anxiety, but human connectivity, that milk of human compassion and kindness is still one of the, the areas uh, no, it does not replace medicine, but it's still one of those areas that lifts people, that gives us a, a natural high uh, mentally and, and emotionally. And in the workplace, can, can we do that? I mean, do, can we go talk to a coworker about mental health issues like we can cancer? I don't think so. I, I think, I it's, I think it's situational. It is. Yeah. I mean, it I is. certainly have no two dozen people in this company that if I had a problem, I would feel entirely comfortable going to, but that's but, me, but, but, but that's but not if, everybody. But if, but if, if you found out that you had melanoma, you had skin cancer, oh, it'd be, you, you'd be could, nothing. You, you'd, you'd put yeah. a ribbon on, yep. you, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't care for everybody in the company knew about it's it. It's irrelevant. Yeah. But it, if you had anxiety that was, that was debilitating to the sense that, you know, certain days you had a tough time just, just performing your basic task. I mean, I, I wonder if our, if our own systems within the company, the healthcare system we've got in the company and so forth, do we address these things properly? I don't know. I mean, these are still things that we're, we're wrestling with. Like I said, we are in mental health today where we were in cancer, uh, I, I'm, I'm sad to say, decades ago. As you, as you look back over the time that your family has been involved in cancer research and care and the amount of money, not just from your family, but from the U.S. government and just society generally, what do you think it's going to take and what are some of those best practices that you saw over those three decades to try to, to narrow that 50-year time horizon on the brain? I, is it I, just money? I, it, well, it, What is it? I guess, it, I guess maybe, maybe with AI and so forth, we're, we're going to need something 
different than what we've had over the last 50 years because the human brain is far more complex than, than a, a cancerous tumor. You can't go in to the human brain, explore the human brain of a living person like you can open somebody up and see tumors. And Yeah, that, there's some intangible there when you yeah. think about the brain. It's obviously a physical thing, but yeah. it's function and what it does. It's, it's not like a, you know, kidneys that just process food. And, and so you remember with cancer, who was the president who declared war on cancer the first time? Richard Nixon. I was just about to say Richard Nixon. Yeah, Richard yeah. Nixon declared I was thinking war EPA on cancer. and cancer. Yeah, it was 50 years ago, over 50 years ago. And who's the president who's now proclaiming the moonshot to cure cancer? Joe Biden. Uh, yeah, and I think once he may have already said that it's been cured. Well, it, it hasn't. And then he's a great man for bringing attention to it. He's lost a son to cancer. And I think he He's very sincere in this area. We're going to need something like that in mental health. We, we haven't, again, we haven't even started. We haven't had a president yet or a leader or a national movement yet that, is gonna, that has come out and said, we need to do it. This needs to be a, a moonshot type. This needs to be a, an Apollo type study for us. And you look at crime, you look at suicide rates and, and mental illness. It's a plague. It's a, and the plague is, is we're not doing enough to try to solve it. So, yeah. I hand it to my siblings who are doing a heck of a lot more than I'm doing in this area, especially on mental health. I, you know, I think as a family, my father's passion was cancer and the next generation is going to be cancer and it's going to be mental health. I want to finish by talking about the Huntsman culture and our company's been in existence for a half century and you've been here for pretty much all of it or around the hoop on all of it. And we have our own unique culture. And when you think about that culture, what comes to your mind and and how do you think about company culture it's respect for the individual i mean i used to think that it was it was a family culture you know we're a family owned enterprise well the huntsman family collectively all of the huntsman families combined i think we own less than five percent of the company this is not a family owned business it's not even a family run business but i'd like to think that that the virtues of a family, and I, I don't necessarily mean that in the traditional sense, but a, a, a group of people who are willing to look out for each other, who are willing to care about each other, that are mired in their own flaws and imperfections, but in spite of that are willing to maybe listen a little bit more, maybe extend a hand in friendship or assistance and so forth. And that is what a culture is all about. And yes, I know the areas of the, the company that we have people working from home. We've had that for decades. A lot of our sales reps around the world, they work from home. Uh, since COVID, we've had more people that are work from home. Got it. But the vast majority of our people, I want them in the office as often as we can get them there because that is our culture. This is not a company that makes decisions that has an issue before it and we say, well, we got a board meeting coming up in two months. Let's wait two months and make a decision. This is a company, I hope, that is making decisions in hallways. And I always like when I walk by someone's office and I just see two or three people in the office and they're just in there talking. And it, they may not even be talking about business issues. Maybe they think, well, we're, we're not doing anything productive here. You know what? You're, you're, you're building friendships. You're, you're building, you're, you're overcoming and exposing vulnerabilities. And you're, the closer you are with your coworker, the co closer you trust them, the closer that friendship exists, the easier you're going to be to express an idea, to express a criticism, not to, in a negative sense, but Kevin, that's, a, that's not a bad idea, but how about if we did it this way? And you can take that because you know me well enough to know that I'm not saying this to hurt you, but I care about you. And that doesn't come about just because we have offices next to each other. It comes about because we have that human connectivity and that human interaction. And trust. And trust. And those, those things come because we work together, because we, we're, we're touching each other. Now. We're in the same place at the same time. Yeah, I, again, I, I get it that there's, there's a need and time and place for working from home and all that other stuff. But culture, what differentiates us from BSF, from Dow, from Bayer, from all these other, you know, Covestro and all these other companies, it is our people. And if they lose that ability to listen, to learn, to create, to incentivize, to have energy, eh, we're just like anybody else. Right now, there's some potential employee who's looking for a job on LinkedIn, and they're going to come across a Huntsman job posting, and they're going to apply for that job, and maybe it's competitive. 
if you could talk to that person, why should they join Huntsman and what sets us apart? Really easily go talk to any of the interns that come to this company. They all say the same thing, the people. People care. And I feel like I was, as, an, as a lowly intern, you know, <laughs> to sophomore in college, I came here and I felt like I was a member of the team after a couple of days. I love that. That, that means more to me than, you know, I, I came up with an alchemy of turning dirt into MDI or something. I mean, the, the, the idea that we have people that can come in here and within a matter of days, they feel like they're valued and they feel like they're at home and they feel like they're working with friends and they're working with people they didn't know a week ago. Wow. That's that, in my opinion, that's the greatest thing that this company will ever will ever produce. Human creativity. Peter, thank you for joining me today. I thought this was a fantastic discussion. I loved the trip around the world. You have a fantastic perspective that I think is based in just a lot of experience in the business and in these areas. And I know that our associates are going to also appreciate that. I hope you'll come back on the podcast later this year. And frankly, I hope that at some point you take the host seat. We have to find you a guest that you just want to sit in here and interview and learn from. Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to, to do this. I've done this with a handful of individuals. You're, you've been a wonderful host. I would, I'd really like to give some thought. I, you know who I'd really love to interview is my brother, John. I think that would be wonderful. And you know, here's a guy that's been a U.S. ambassador to Singapore, U.S. trade representative ambassador. He's been an ambassador to China. He's been an ambassador to Russia. And he's one, just one of the smartest people. He's the one that got all the IQ and intellect in the family. And then the second kid came along, me. And there wasn't anything left, and that started building back up in the third and fourth kid. But I, I'm, I'm going to see if I can't get him here sometime and just get his perspective on the world. Thank you very much for the invitation. Peter, I'm confident we'll have thousands of employees and maybe millions of people that would love to hear that one. Thank you, listeners, for tuning into another episode of Huntsman Knows How. I'm your host, Kevin Gunderson, and we've been talking today with Peter Huntsman. If you have any ideas or suggestions for topics on Huntsman Knows How, shoot me an email, give me a call, fire off a text. We'd love to hear your ideas. We'll see you next time.